This video will serve as an introduction to carbohydrates. A carbohydrate can be defined as a polyhydroxyaldehyde or a polyhydroxyketone or a substance that gives these compounds on hydrolysis. Let's take a closer look at the two words polyhydroxyaldehyde and polyhydroxyketone. Polyhydroxy implies many hydroxy groups. A hydroxy group may be f more familiar to you as an OH group or an alcohol group as we learned in organic chemistry. And you know the structure of an aldehyde. So we have this compound that has many hydroxy groups with an aldehyde. This would imply there are also many carbons in this compound. Polyhydroxyketone, very similar, but instead of an aldehyde, there is a ketone. The simplest carbohydrate is a monosaccharide. Monosaccharides have a general formula CN2NON. Just from this formula, you can see there are just as many oxygens as there are carbons. A polyhydroxyaldehyde can also be called an aldose and a ketose is a polyhydroxyketone. A Fischer projection is an important structural representation of carbohydrates. In the figure on the screen to the right is an example of a Fischer projection. The intersection of the crossed lines represent a carbon and there are four groups, in this case, attached to this carbon. A more familiar representation is to the left, which is a three-dimensional rendering of a Lewis structure. We can see the horizontal lines in the Lewis structure are those groups that are coming towards you or pointing out of the screen. Those groups bonded in the vertical direction are pointing away from you or going into the screen. There is also another important component to Fischer projections, and that is the DNL designation and the penultimate carbon. The penultimate carbon is the next to the last carbon on the vertical carbon chain. You will not be responsible for memorizing the formal names for any carbohydrates, but I do want you to recognize the components of the systematic or formal names of carbohydrates. There's the DNL designation, there's the prefix which indicates some information about the structure of the carbohydrate, and there's the ending or the suffix OSE which implies that the molecule is a carbohydrate. I do want you to recognize if a carbohydrate is a ketose or an aldose, and because of all of the hydroxy groups in a carbohydrate. Monosaccharides and disaccharides are very soluble in water. Here is a handful of monosaccharides drawn as Fischer projections. Notice these are all D carbohydrates. They are carbohydrates because their names end in OSE, but they have different prefixes because they're structurally different from one another. The top four are tetroses and pentoses meaning four carbon carbohydrates, tetro, and pent for five, or five carbon carbohydrates. Also notice that the top five are aldoses, because the top group in the Fischer projection for all five of these carbohydrates is an aldehyde. I encourage you to draw the Lewis structure for that top group to verify that it is an aldehyde. The bottom three are hexoses, or six-carbon monosaccharides. The first two of the bottom six are aldoses, and the third one is a ketose. Monosaccharides are in equilibrium between their straight-chain form and a cyclic form. They primarily exist as ring structures. The reason for drawing Fischer projections allows us to easily recognize some of the basic structural features of a carbohydrate. There is another particular carbon in a carbohydrate that is important. 
and it is called the anomeric carbon. When the straight chain closes and forms a ring, there is also an additional structural feature that is important, alpha and beta designation. We'll take a look at all of this next. Let's take a closer look at what happens when the straight chain closes and forms a ring. A new bond is formed between these two groups and the bond is changed. The new bond is between the oxygen and the carbon and what is changed is the carbon double bonded to the oxygen it is now single bonded with a hydrogen bonded to the oxygen. Conservation of mass is sustained. We didn't gain any new atoms, we didn't lose any atoms. We just moved them around. As a reminder, this carbon in the ring is the penultimate carbon, and that was carbon number five. Remember this? There's the CH2OH group, there's the CH2OH group. Here's the carbon bonded to the CH2OH, and here's the same carbon bonded to the CH2OH, which is the penultimate carbon. And we can see that here also. Anomeric carbon on both ring structures. This is a very important structural feature that I'm going to need you to be aware of. This is beta, again, because the CH2OH is on the same side of the ring as the OH, and this is alpha because the CH2OH is on the opposite side of the OH. It is customary that cyclic saccharides are represented in this fashion. The way to determine where the penultimate carbon and the anomeric carbon are by finding the oxygen in the ring structure. The carbon to the left of the oxygen, which should have the CH2OH bonded to it, is the penultimate carbon. And the carbon bonded to the OH, which is also bonded to the oxygen, is the anomeric. So, in summary, look for the penultimate carbon and the anomeric carbon on opposite sides of the oxygen in the ring. An important reaction between a monocyclic saccharide and other molecules is the formation of a glycosidic bond. The anomeric carbon in a cyclic monosaccharide plays an active role in the formation of a glycosidic bond. A glycosidic bond is a bond between the anomeric carbon and the oxygen of another molecule. For example, glucose reacts with methanol to form two new molecules. The glycosidic bond is between the anomeric carbon and the oxygen of the methanol molecule the beta version and the alpha version form. Now that you're aware of the glycosidic bond and how it forms, let's take a look at a few disaccharides. First we'll look at sucrose. The two structures on the screen are equivalent. The one on the right is typically drawn in organic chemistry. But here the anomeric carbon of the glucose played an active role in bonding to the fructose. So the glycosidic bond is relative to the glucose. In this case, it's an alpha glycosidic bond. Next, we'll look at lactose, which is a disaccharide that has a glycosidic bond between a galactose and a glucose molecule. The glycosidic bond is relative to the galactose because the glycosidic bond is formed between the anomeric carbon of galactose and the OH on the glucose. And because the glucose is on the same side of the ring as the CH2OH on the galactose, it is a beta glycosidic bond. And finally, we'll look at maltose, which is two glucose units bonded together by a glycosidic bond. And relative to the glycosidic bond of the glucose unit on the left, 
this is an alpha glycosidic bond because the CH2OH is on the opposite side of the, the other glucose unit. Now that you're aware of how disaccharides are formed and what a glycosidic bond is, we'll look at three common polysaccharides, starch, glycogen, and cellulose. They are all composed of many glucose units held together by glycosidic bonds. I want you to identify the glycosidic bond and determine if it's alpha or beta. We'll begin with starch, which is composed of amylose and amylopectin. Amylose is a smaller polysaccharide composed of approximately 4,000 glucose units joined by alpha glycosidic bonds. Amylopectin is a larger polysaccharide. Its glucose units are also held together by alpha glycosidic bonds. But this larger polysaccharide has branch points we can see the alpha glycosidic bond that holds together these glucose units in amylose. We also see the alpha glycosidic bond that holds the glucose units in the main chain of amylopectin. Also note at the branch point is another alpha glycosidic bond. You need not be concerned with the carbon position numbers 1, 4, or 1, 6. I want you to be able to identify the glycosidic bond and determine if it's alpha or beta. Next we'll look at glycogen. Glycogen looks similar to amylopectin. And finally cellulose. Cellulose, unlike the other two polysaccharides, is held together by beta glycosidic bonds. I also included the structure for amylose below the structure of cellulose to compare the beta to alpha glycosidic bond. Here are some additional images that you could study from to identify the glycosidic bonds in these large polysaccharides. And finally, I'd like for you to know three reactions that involve monosaccharides. First, reduction using sodium borohydride. Recall reduction is addition of hydrogen or the loss of oxygen. The equilibrium between the cyclic form of glucose and the straight chain form of glucose lies primarily towards the cyclic form, but the reduction reaction drives the reaction towards the straight chain form ultimately to reduction. So compare the straight chain form of glucose to glucotol, the product. Where did the reduction occur? Compare the structures. After analyzing all of the carbons in the chain, you should notice that the aldehyde in the top of the glucose chain is reduced to an alcohol. There is an addition of two hydrogens to that group, which is consistent with the definition of reduction. Also notice the rest of the chain remains unreacted. The next reaction is oxidation. Here it's clear that the alcohol group at the bottom of the chain is oxidized to a carboxylic acid group. Recall the definition of oxidation is the gain of oxygen or the loss of hydrogen. So it is clear the alcohol group lost two hydrogens and gained one oxygen to become a carboxylic acid. And finally, phosphorylation. A phosphate group is connected to the primary alcohol in a glucose chain. Where the CH2OH was at the bottom of the chain is now become a CH2 phosphate. 